Welcome to a new episode of Impact TV. My name is Michelle Franke and I will be your host tonight together with Friso Viersen. And Friso works Hello. at the European Cultural Foundation. Hello. <laughs> and uh, the Urban Dutank Expodium. And we are both part of the Impact TV editorial board to select the finest topics for these monthly events. And uh, we are part of the editorial board together with Arjun Dunevind, uh, director at Impact, and Rosa Wevers uh, of the Universiteit Utrecht. And before we dive into the stormy topic of tonight, uh, a few notes of introduction. Uh, first of all, if you do not know IMPACT yet, IMPACT is a media arts organization in Utrecht, the Netherlands, and the whole year round we organize events, uh, artist talks, screenings and exhibitions, both online and offline, to try to make sense of our contemporary media culture. And tonight, uh, our online event is the first one we do on Planet Impact. And uh, this is our uh, brand new portal to uh, do our online uh, events. If you are not on Planet Impact, but are following this on the stream on Facebook or YouTube, please check it out. Uh, you can follow uh, the same stream on planet.impact.nl. But uh, next to the live stream, you can also find um, the possibility to ask questions live during the program uh, with a chat or by email. You can also find a lot of exclusive content and, of course, the rooftop bar to talk after uh, the event. Um, so um, for uh, tonight, uh, we launch this portal with uh, Impact TV, a recurring monthly broadcast. And for each episode, we invite speakers to talk about a current social debate or theme. The first one we did about NFTs, and tonight we are very excited to talk about conspiracy theories. And instead of immediately dismissing them as nonsense, what we actually want to do is place them in context and see them also as important cultural indicators, uh, telling us also about the worries and fears, as well as value systems that might not be shared uh, by everyone. So. In this Impact TV episode, we will be discussing uh, both the use and misuse of conspiracy theories with two very special guests. And we are very happy to have here with us uh, first, Laudie van den Heuvel. She's investigative journalist and researcher. She's also a member of the Zetkin Collective, uh, researching what happens when um, you combine far-right extremism and ecology. So we might want to hear more about that. Uh, Laudi recently published a very interesting article in the Groene Amsterdammer, a Dutch magazine, about the US roots and connection of Dutch conspiracy groups. So if you are curious, you can find this article in the exclusive content section of Planet Impact on the first floor. Uh, where we gathered uh, a lot of interesting links and videos and, and articles uh, such as this one. Our second speaker for tonight is Florian Kramer. He's a writer, photographer, filmmaker and theorist. And he teaches at the Willem de Koning Academy in Rotterdam, uh, Visual Culture and Autonomous Practices. We know Florian already from the Impact web project Radicalization Words by Design. Uh, where he spoke with us about the darkest regions of the web, including conspiracy theories. So also this one, you can check it out on the exclusive content uh, section on the first floor, both the entire web project and Florian's contribution. So without further ado, let's start. Um, we asked the speakers to give us two short presentations to immediately dive into the matter. We asked them to react on two statements. That finally, now I have an opportunity to speak so too. Thanks, Michelle, for the <laughs> Finally. Those two statements are conspiracy theories always have an element of truth. And a second statement that both Laudi and Florian will be touching on in their presentations is conspiracy theories can be useful political tools. Without much further ado, Laudi, may we give the floor to you? Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm first going to give a short introduction about myself, actually. Um, 
So, uh, my name is Laudi van den Heuvel and I'm a human ecologist, which means that I study the relationship between humans and their surroundings. And, um, yeah, like you said, I'm working as an independent researcher and I focus on the far right, um, on human nature relationships and conspiracy theories, because they are very much connected. I'm indeed a member of the Zetkin Collective. Uh, we are a research collective of um, scholars, activists, uh, students, former students, and we all do research in the field of uh, far right and uh, the environment. So we look at how the far right actually deals with topics such as climate change. And we have recently published a book called White Skin Black Fuel on the danger of fossil fascism, in which we actually, um, it's a study of how the far right deals with climate change, but also uh, we touch upon how their ties with the fossil industry uh, are and, and how the notion of race actually also ties into this. And in the past months, I've been working together with Alexander Boonda uh, of Platform Authentique Journalistique on this investigation on a bit more of the history behind conspiracy theories and who actually spreads them. Um, so we wrote this article, which indeed uh, has been published in the Groene Amsterdam last January, about mainly about the far-right libertarian John Birch Society and their role in spreading conspiracy theories. So yeah, let's start with the first um, statement. Conspiracy theories always have an element of truth. Um, regarding the question of whether or not conspiracy theories always have an element of truth, it more or less depends on um, a couple of things. First of all, to what extent do we have to stick to the notion of always, I think? And secondly, how do you understand the meaning of conspiracy theories? I mean, you could simply take a definition from a dictionary, but somehow that kind of implies that the term is rather neutral, which actually isn't, because the concept conspiracy theories actually heavily loaded with connotations, like often negative ones. And I think that's partly also because nowadays the, the, the notion of conspiracy theory is very often um, used interchangeably with the notion of fake news, which is incorrect, in fact, because fake news is disinformation, uh, while conspiracy theories indeed can be true, like Florian Kramer also said in the previous um, broadcast. I think, in general, conspiracy theories include some sort of belief that there is this group of people that in secrecy is uh, planning something together or is hiding something deliberately or has a hidden agenda, which would have a negative impact on the people that are not in this group. And right now we can, of course, see all these, all these conspiracy theories going on about vaccinations or the government being a pedophile club. And I think, it, even though it's important, it doesn't always make sense only to look at to what extent these specific allegations are actually true or not. I think it's important that you actually look more beneath that surface. Like, why do these people actually believe this? In, because it is some sort of skepticism towards hegemony, in a sense, like, it's a skepticism towards the general belief system of what is considered culturally appropriate. Why? Why is there this skepticism? To me, personally, um, I see conspiracy theories as ways to simplify complexi uh, like the complexity of very... Um, or like to simplify the complexity of situations and uncertainties. Um, Conspiracy theories can be the answer to um, why and where things have gone wrong very often. And even though the actual theory might be false, the reason for believing in a conspiracy theory might still hold. I mean, there are things to be critical of in this society. That's totally legitimate. Like, there is a lot of lobbying going on, and there are companies misusing their economic power, and there is a lot of negotiating happening behind closed doors. So, I believe that people who believe in conspiracy theories are generally very critical people, 
um, that pose legitimate questions about processes in our society. Um, but probably they're easily drawn, or too easily drawn even, to explanations that kind of answer all their uncertainties, uh, no matter if the explanation actually is true or not. And once you have the answer, it's, it is also hard to come back to it and say like, ooh, maybe I've been wrong there. And a good example I came across very recently was in a, re a recent episode of uh, Philemon and the Complotter, in which uh, Philemon talks to a lady who believes that 5G has ruined her health. And so far, you know, society actually believes that uh, this is largely untrue, like 5G is largely un un unharmful. But she is totally convinced of that truth, and she even admitted that even though it might turn out that it's not true, that it's not harmful, she will not believe in it because that is the way she thinks now. And once you are in that position, you easily also slide further into other conspiracies about 5G being used to brainwash and suppress people and so on and so forth. But is 5G dangerous? Maybe so. Maybe it turns out to be true. Are the ruling powers suppressing people? Maybe not with 5G, but I do believe that there is a hegemony that kind of exists that might not benefit everyone in this society. And it's this, these people are critical upon for their own reasons. So is there an element of truth in conspiracy theories? I think there definitely can be, especially in a reason to believe in these theories. All right, um, conspiracy theories can be useful political tools. Um, well, to answer that question, whether or not conspiracy theories can be useful political tools, I think first and foremost, it is very important to make a very clear distinction between those who believe in conspiracy theories and those who actually deliberately spread them. Especially because political tool implies some sort of um, intentionality, which, which is like the wish to influence people, a network. Um, so, as I said, together with Alexander Bönder, I've looked at uh, who are behind spreading conspiracy theories. And we did see a tendency that people who actually deliberately spread conspiracy theories that they usually have some form of a political agenda behind them. And secondly, we saw that um, that political agenda creates very interesting and unexpected alliances between people you wouldn't necessarily um, expect to see together. Um, an example in history I can talk about is the case of Lee Thrile in the 1960s and 1970s. This lethrile was some sort of quackery medicament uh, made from apricot pits uh, that was claimed to cure cancer. And the stuff was actually heavily promoted by far-right conservative libertarians, such as the American John Birch Society, which is actually known for spreading anti-communist uh, conspiracy theories. But lethrile was also promoted by right-wing Christians and New Age people and spiritualists. And what we saw, what these groups had in common, that was actually a very heavy skepticism towards the establishment, such as the government and the pharmaceutical companies, all for their own reasons. And this funny mix of spirituality and conspiracy thinking has actually been called conspirituality. There is a lot going on about this lately. And this wasn't only happening in the United States, it was also happening in the Netherlands, actually. Um, you know, in the 1970s, uh, Lethrail was promoted by a group that actually consisted of a bunch of New Age spiritualists, uh, herbal healers, dowsers, uh, right-wing Christians, and even far-right politicians and people with connections to neo-Nazi groupsicles. So here you see the same kind of alliance of very spiritual people and the, the far-right people and, and conservatives. But going back to the political tools, um, these spreaders, they have a political agenda too. 
And many of these people who deliberately spread conspiracy theories, they earn money by doing so. They earn money on selling healing stones, on selling food supplements, radiation shields, expensive raw food, detox, yoga retreats or whatever, with which they actually promote or promise salvation to those who are seeking that. And right now we can see the exact same conspirituality mix in the corona manifestations and protests. Like we can distill people with far-right sympathies, we can distill libertarians, anarchists, anti-vaxxers, um, spiritual, spiritually awakened people. Um, and the funny thing is what they're combining is the very negative uh, conspiracy message of suppression with the more positive sounding uh, message of enlightenment and love. And they share each other's work on social media too. So to conclude, yes, I think conspiracy theories can definitely be political tools, uh, in particular for those who have a political agenda and for those who believe in conspiracy theories, it can either be a form of salvation Conspiracy theories can be a form of salvation or a form of critique against the establishment, which I think in a moderate form can keep a society very sharp, but in an extreme form can cause harm or can be dangerous for society, even or especially if the conspiracy theories are based upon fake news and misinformation. Thank you very much, Laudi. One short question, if I may. You were making a link between, let's say, a healthy critique onto a hegemonical establishment and people looking for salvation. And in the beginning of your introduction, you were mentioning that you like to look at conspiracy theories and dive beneath their actual meaning. So I'm going to try to challenge you to look on the other side and look on the top hand. Because if people are looking for salvation, it means that they are rather believing in a natural order which is a higher order than the actual order that we are living in mm -hmm. and would there be a direct link between people believing in conspiracy theories rejecting our actual order because there must be a higher more natural order uh, it, must, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that i think there are very uh, many reasons for people to believe in conspiracy theories uh, I think researchers have shown that people that believe in conspiracy theories also often have a very religious element, that you can actually see the same kind of elements with conspiracy thinkers and with religious people in the sense, like, yes, there is something higher, but it can, it can be very many things. Um, I remember that I spoke to the, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, how would they translate that to English? Like the society against quackery and what they actually said was for example people that believe in alternative medicine um, are also often people that believe in conspiracy theories but they do that because for example they can't get help anymore using normal medicine and then they get a bit um well they they, they are seeking other ways of of getting better um to see if that actually works. It's like their last hope. So to that extent, there are many reasons for people to believe in conspiracy theories. And I think not wanting to accept that life is ending or that like the, the whole idea of, of, of materialism, that that doesn't fit them. I, I think that can be very valid reason to actually start thinking or, or like start believing in conspiracy theories, yes. Thank you. Um, when I'm looking at the clock, I see that we're actually a little bit beyond schedule already. Uh, so it happens. Florian, if you are ready, may we invite you to take the floor right away. Which hopefully will turn up now. Um, hello, my name is Florian Kramer. And um, I want to speak about four conspiracy uh, theories or conspiracy myths. And um, yeah, that's maybe the um, I completely agree with uh, what Lodi said, but maybe I have only one disagreement. I think that we need to differentiate between 
conspiracy myths and conspiracy theories. And conspiracy myths would be something that indeed is, is, is a complete fiction, um, um, is, is a complete uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, ideological fabrication. A good example would be, for example, the Jewish world conspiracy. Uh, but then conspiracy theories uh, can be actual uh, theories also in, in, a, in a scientific or in a research sense. And sometimes also um, the area or the differentiation between the two, between um, a founded, uh, factually based conspiracy theory and a conspiracy mythology uh, can be blurry. And that's what I'm going to talk about. The first example I, I want to bring up is that of the um, NSA surveillance of the internet and of telecommunications. What we're seeing here um, is uh, the poster of a Hollywood action movie from 2009. And uh, Echelon was the name um, under which the telecommunication surveillance program of the NSA was known uh, or more or less known because factually it was a conspiracy theory at that point. Um, um, this movie came out four years before Snowden went uh, public and leaked uh, the actual information, um, the, the data uh, that uh, these conspiracy theories were completely true. But before 2013, um, um, the claim that there's a near total surveillance of the internet through the NSA and befriended agencies um, was something where, for example, people from hacker culture, media activists, artists such as Heath Bunting uh, were dismissed for as, as paranoid fantasies. Uh, and through Snowden, it became known that uh, this was a reality and actually that the reality was much worse than, than the previous uh, conspiracy theory. My second example and it's very well known in, in art history and in the art world, is that of American express, uh, uh, abstract expressionism. So um, the conspiracy theory is abstract, uh, abstract expressionism, action painting by Jackson Pollock was supported and financed by the CIA. Turns out this is true. Um, uh, there were traveling exhibitions of American abstract expressionist painting through the uh, whole world, and they were financed by the CIA in collaboration with private sponsors. Um, there was a whole series of intellectual journals uh, published in different languages, uh, uh, published by front organizations of the CIA called Congress of Cultural Freedom and American Con uh, Committee for Cultural Freedom. And the influential um, art critic Clement Greenberg, who was the main theorist of abstract expressionism, and the painter Jackson Pollock were officially members of the American Committee for uh, Cultural Freedom. Um, now, uh, there have been scholarly articles on this link since the 1970s, but the first comprehensive research into the CIA financing of abstract expressionism was in a book from 1999, Francis Stoner Saunders, The Cultural uh, Cold War. And um, uh, it should now also be noted that some of these former CIA front cultural organizations were continued by the George uh, Soros Foundation in Eastern Europe in the 1990s, which brings us right into contemporary cons right-wing conspiracy theories and conspiracy myths around uh, George uh, Soros that nowadays often come from the extreme right um, mixed with anti-Semitism. So I would say even in those uh, conspiracy fantasies, there is a kernel of truth um, um, if you look into Soros and, and, and the function of the Soros uh, Foundation. Now, um, but just going back to the facts, if anyone would have claimed in the 1950s or 1960s that abstract expressionism was financed by the CIA or um, in the 1990s or 2000s that, that the internet was under total NSA surveillance, you would likely have been declared paranoid or conspiracy crackpot, um, but both are true. Now let's get, get uh, into conspiracy narratives where fact and mythology are much harder to separate. Um, and uh, a, you could say a left-wing conspiracy theory, um, which I think is a, a, both a theory and a myth, is uh, neoliberalism. The difficult thing is that neoliberalism is actually a real conspiracy and partly a left-wing conspiracy narrative. So let me try to untangle this. Originally, neoliberalism was a term coined in the late 1930s by European liberal politicians and thinkers and strategists after the collapse of economic liberalism um, during the economic uh, crash of 1929. And, um, but the way neoliberalism is being understood today is actually quite the opposite of how neoliberalism was conceived back in that time, uh, because actually the original neoliberalism was uh, uh, capitalism with strong social securities as opposed to laissez-faire capitalism. Um, neoliberalism was 
factually the economic system of continental post-war Europe, including particularly Germany and the Netherlands. So, and there is actually a real neoliberal conspiracy, namely the main thinkers, politicians and proponents of economic, political and philosophical liberalism were organized in the Mont Pelerin Society, um, a society whose first meeting was on the Mont Pelerin, a, a, a mountain in the Swiss Alps in 1947. And um, now the Mont Pelerin uh, Society prominently included, by the way, the coiner, the inventor of the word conspiracy theory, namely the liberal philosopher Karl Popper. So you can say, um, uh, you know, the, the term um, conspiracy theory was coined by liberal rationalist philosophers to discredit uh, people who think that there are conspiracies, although you could say it was actually coined as part of a, of a, of a political conspiracy uh, uh, called neoliberalism. The, the problem is that where the factual um, uh, conspiracy theory of neoliberalism becomes murky and turns into mythology is that um, what we nowadays uh, uh, associate with neoliberalism is actually rather that uh, system of laissez-faire capitalism that was represented by the other wing of the Mont Pelerin society, namely uh, Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, and the, the political programs of deregulation that were first begun uh, in South America in the 1970s, then with Reaganomics uh, in the USA and with Thatcherism uh, in, in, in the US and then in the 1990s also in continental Europe. But the po point was that those who called them orig themselves originally neoliberals left the uh, Mont Pelerin Society be because they disagreed with the laissez-faire uh, capitalism of Friedman and Hayek. Um, so um, uh, I, I could go into more details why I think that, that neoliberalism, neo neoliberalism was misunderstood or misframed by the political left. Um, uh, it has to do with, with the way uh, Michel Foucault wrote about it and how this was perceived by the political left. Um, but um, uh, it might, might also have to do with the fact that the term liberal um, has a different meaning in America. So liberal is, is in America for strange reasons is broadly uh, identified with the political left. So if you want to, to make a differentiation between liberal as in political left and neoliberal as in laissez-faire capitalism, then it makes sense to use that terminology. But you could say, you could argue that there is a mix of a real conspiracy, um, a real neoliberal conspiracy called the Mont Pelerin Society, and a conspiracy mythology that misidentifies um, the kind of um, regulated uh, uh, capitalism that is typical for continental Europe with a kind of laissez-faire uh, uh, capitalism of, of Friedman, um, Hayek, uh, Thatcher and Reagan. Now, the, um, the last conspiracy uh, mythology or theory I want to talk about is one that is uh, very uh, common right now in the political right, that's that of cultural Marxism. Now, this conspiracy myth um, goes back to the American extreme right. And it's also popular with contemporary uh, right-wing figures such as Jordan Peterson or uh, in the Netherlands, Thierry Baudet. And um, basically what it does, it blames cultural Marxism for um, corrupting cultural norms uh, and traces it back mostly to the Frankfurt School um, of critical theory, and then extends it to uh, contemporary cultural theory, feminism, post-colonialism, and often lumps it together with uh, postmodernism. So, for example, um, uh, if you listen to Jordan Peterson on YouTube, then he always speaks about postmodern neo-Marxism. Now, there are anti-Semitic undertones since the founders of the Frankfurt School were of Jewish origin, um, but it's also, I would say, a typical American misreading, since um, what happened is that the Frankfurt School called its own branch of sociological research uh, critical theory, um, which in Europe is only understood as referring to the Frankfurt School, while in America, critical theory then became an umbrella term for any kind of cultural theory, such as post-structuralism, cultural studies, feminist studies, post-colonial studies, uh, many or most of which don't refer to the Frankfurt School at all. Um, <clears throat> and what is perhaps even more hilarious is that this, this kind of contemporary right-wing rejection of um, post-structuralism and post-modernism has been completely shared by the Frankfurt School since Habermas uh, 
the late uh, uh, member of the Frankfurt School, in turn accused French uh, uh, post-structuralist philosophers Foucault and uh, Derrida of being neoconservative. So, so the Frankfurt School actually didn't want to have anything to do with, with so-called French philosophy, uh, which now is being blamed as being, being a part of cultural Marxism by, by the extreme right. Um, you could even go farther and say that the contemporary right and the Frankfurt School shared actually many ideas, such as cultural pessimism, rejection of mass culture and of uh, po popular culture, um, critique of alienation and modern culture, um, which in the case of Adorno even included a, a yeah, outright racist rejection of black music. So I think if, if you know, the extreme right would actually read some of the Frankfurt School works, <laughs> they, they might be surprised. However, um, I think there is a, still a kernel of truth in this kind of mixed up uh, conspiracy mythology of cultural Marxism um, for several reasons. Um, Number one, uh, indeed, if you go back to the Frankfurt School, you can say it's Marxist sociology focused on culture rather than on economy, like, like classical Marxism. And then secondly, there actually has been such a thing as cultural Marxism as a proper school, but just not where the, the conspiracy mythologists think it is, namely in British post-war Marxist cultural studies and its follow-up in the 1980s uh, in a school of uh, cultural theory that called itself cultural materialism and cultural materialism in the Marxist sense. So they actually called themselves cultural Marxist, but it's just that the right-wing conspiracy mythologists don't know this, this and uh, let's say point their fingers at the, at, at the wrong academics. Um, the likely problem, I guess, is that um, this school of cultural materialism is too marginal and too little known outside the humanities to serve as the scapegoat and grand uh, conspiracy narrative. Um, yeah, we could go even, in, even into more details that actually there has been, again, another kind of uh, branch of Marxism that has been culturally oriented, uh, namely um, that of uh, the Italian Marxism of Antonio Gramsci and his successors, which was cultural in the sense that it abandoned the old revolution paradigm in favor of obtaining discursive hegemony in society. And again, um, these are bad scape, uh, scapegoats for the current conspiracy mythology of cultural Marxism, because actually the Gramscian um, hegemony strategy has been adopted by the extreme right since the 1960s. Um, the so-called Nouvelle Droite or the European New Right and following the American so-called alt-right actually adopted uh, Gramsci's uh, theory for their own ends. And so you could call them actually cultural fascists who use neo-Marxist tact tactics, which makes it very difficult to, uh, for them to kind of attack this, this uh, branch of, of uh, yeah, cultural Marxism. So that's basically um, uh, what I wanted to say that if you look closely, well, uh, I think you have to make the, the differentiation between conspiracy theory um, which is research, which is fact-based or evidence-based and, and uh, uh, conspiracy mythology. Uh, but then still it becomes a problem that in these speculative uh, realms, you often have kind of very gray zones be between mythology and theory. Uh, first question, you started wow. by saying <laughs> there is this blurry line between what is a theory and when it becomes a mythology. Mm -hmm. But then um, your knowledge on where all these theories come from is not knowledge that everybody is having or is having, I'm afraid, the time to actually look into. So then <clears throat> people sometimes also start believing things that they are told um, because not everybody dives completely to the roots of a certain mythology to find out there is a theory. How would you, how would you unravel yes, so, this line? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, what is interesting about con contemporary uh, conspiracy mythology, such as QAnon, is that they're actually based on the narrative of doing research. So they don't say, oh, we have a, a explanation, or this is the truth, and this is what you should believe. But they say, we have, these kind of clues or these kind of pointers and do your own research. But then the, the research is just Googling in your own filter bubble. And, and then, of course, then, then you find out that, uh, I don't know, Bill Gates is in bed with uh, George uh, Soros to reprogram the world through 5G or something like that. Yeah? that. That is the problem. So actually, the problem is, you could say, the quality of research. And, and, and maybe 
now more than ever before, the quality of research is what, what uh, differentiates a mythology from, from a theory. How do you Thank see you. the role also of, uh, of media in this? Because I yes. hear something like uh, now people, uh, they, they tell you to do your research, but then you do research and you are in an environment where actually, where, where, where these uh, theories are active or and can free, much freely, more freely spread their ideas than uh, maybe before. Yeah, uh, if, if you look into also the counterculture of conspiracy theories and conspiracy mythologies, then you see it, it all existed before the internet. Um, um, especially if you look into like, for example, 1970s and 1980s uh, uh, subculture, there was a book in America that was called High Weirdness uh, by Mail. And that was uh, published by the Church of the Genius, which is a kind of parodistic, very hilarious church that kind of uh, parodies uh, evangelical uh, churches and their founder Ivan Stang made basically a kind of um, compilation book on crackpot fringe organizations and and how how you could contact them uh, how they would se send you newsletters so that was all before the internet and if you see that directory that book I actually have a copy of it you know it's like one-to-one -one, it's exactly the same stuff that we have today it's like neo-nazis it's anti-waxers it's 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 john f kennedy it's it's uh anti-semites but it's also people uh with with grounded conspiracy theories on on surveillance etc cetera, etc cetera. so i wouldn't uh say that anything has changed uh substantially in in the kind of stories that get told or in in, in the mythologies that exist uh but um they just have, let's say, gained a new quality through networking. Uh, because of course, um, um, this is a bottom up, this is a peer to peer uh, discourse. So if you have a medium uh, that is not a classical editorial medium, but uh, where indeed um, the, the difference between consumers and producers is being uh, uh, abolished, then this greatly helps yeah. uh, to, to foster uh, these narratives and they become can become more mainstream than they, they became in the past. Although again, I mean, if you look back to the 1930s and for example, uh, the, the, the conspiracy mythology of a Jewish world conspiracy, which was you know, common, uh, common sense in, 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 in the Third Reich, uh, then, then you, you cannot just blame it on the internet. So I think, yeah, it's, 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 it's complex. But media always play, play, play a, a, a role. Back in the 1930s, propaganda press, today, uh, propaganda channels on the internet. But the big difference, of course, is that back then it was a centralized media, um, actually decided for by special ministries, deciding what should be in the mass media, and that mm. these days it is much more, no, as you said yourself, bottom so, top, no? No, sorry, but if you if you look, for example, at um, art and literature and, and journalism from the Weimar Republic, you saw it was all there, uh, and and it that was before uh, Hitler took power. I mean, the the, the ground yeah. was already prepared. Um, if you went to Berlin on the street uh, on the streets in the 1920s, and you would just buy arbitrary newspapers, then half of them uh, would be these kind of conspiracy uh, 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 narratives. Right? And, and you see that reflected in, in, in the art. So for example, if you see, for example, the fake news that were produced by the Berlin Dadaists, yeah, they were really kind of just, just echoing that, that, that zeitgeist that existed back in that yeah. time. Because often, uh, I, what I'm also hearing that um, the internet and, and, and media are often seen like, okay, this am amplify, but eventually the, the mm. people that spread that start is maybe the people that also have access to, uh, to journals and and to more uh, traditional media as well yeah that or yeah. i i find it very i find it really difficult question because um you know also in media theory you have two schools you, you have the McLuhan schools which says the medium is the message and then you would say indeed uh, through the structure um, of how a medium like the internet uh, uh, works it can produce these kind of mythologies uh, you can, could have the opposite school uh, of saying, you know, "Don't don't blame the messenger." Yeah? Um, so it's, 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 it, we would have to speculate. So, for example, if the internet uh, uh, wouldn't exist nowadays, but we would still have, let's say, uh, the, the the economic crisis of 2010 and and the Corona lockdown of now, uh, would we have 
had similar conspiracy uh, uh, <coughs> mythologies. I would not be surprised. Yeah? I mean, that the internet is an accelerator and a facilitator, yes, absolutely. But, but I don't think, I think it's, it's uh, the source or it's the reason for, for the existence of these mythologies. Which brings me to a question that came in via one of the channels. Um, so if people are watching on YouTube or Facebook and you would like to post a question, you can just drop them there. And via this internet thingy, we actually have them on a Google sheet here. Uh, this one comes for both you, Laudi, and for you, Florian. It's a question by Lauren Harvey, who's asking, what is the role of facts in conspiracy theories, especially in relation to COVID-19, when information is constantly evolving? And I think, Laudi, we might also include the climate crisis, where we have seen a lot of new facts come to the light. Um, and then how do conspiracy theories react to this new facts? Maybe to start with you, Laudi. Oh, yeah. Um, I think there is a difference between the COVID-19 uh, uh, conspiracy theories and the, the ones around climate change, though, because I believe that climate change is very, very heavy connected to the fossil industry in itself, while COVID um, is not necessarily tied to that kind of big uh, fossil industries. Yes, maybe mm -hmm. the pharmaceuticals uh, to that extent that people are very skeptical towards pharmaceuticals, but the role of facts, um, that's a very, how could I even answer that? I mean, I think there is also a tendency that facts might not fit one's uh, life world to that extent that it doesn't fit with with what the person wants to believe so then it's easy rejecting that stuff and building an alternative narrative that kind of keeps the idea of that per a person alive um, in the sense of COVID-19 the role of facts, I think that's a very difficult thing because um, the people who are supposed to deliver the facts aren't believed anymore. And then the question is, what, whose fault is that and, and what actually causes that? And that is something I don't know, to be honest. Uh, maybe I think that's something that Florian could answer upon better because I, I believe you have a better insight into the, <laughs> the role of, you know, <laughs> the media in that sense. Yeah, but maybe I, I would rather approach it from a kind of philosophical uh, point of view, philosophy of science. And then we are back at Popper who coined uh, the term conspiracy theory, right? In, in, in the Popper school, uh, yeah. which calls itself critical rationalism, you would so solve the issue of yeah, what you call a conspiracy theory, but as being synonymous with the uh, mythology, you would solve that through facts and through uh, factual uh, argumentation. And that's, for example, what uh, so-called analytic philosophy does. So Anglo-American school philosophy um, that would say only that counts what is a fact and that, that what is a proven logical argument yeah? and every, anything else is mythology or untruth and and we need to get that out of the system it's, that's a very old uh, kind of discourse of, of of western philosophy that already started with uh, plato but then you also have a problem that um, you know a fact is not binary um, um, we in, in modern science we have empirism and empirism means you're, you're working on the basis of hypotheses and, 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 and then of proving these hypotheses. But I, Corona is a really beautiful example, actually, how, how, how modern science works, because it constantly has to kind of adjust its hypotheses, yeah? its assumptions also, of, for example, how the, the virus works, how, how sp spreading works, et cetera, et cetera. So if you present it as a kind of binary issue of you know, here's the truth. And that's also a kind of naive uh, uh, picture of science that often we learn in school. Uh, and, and then you suddenly see, okay, there are, for example, virologists that kind of uh, change um, their theory or, or change their assumptions. And you say, oh, they haven't told us the truth, right? Uh, uh, they are betraying us. So this is, I think, the point where this, this, this kind of logical, positivist, uh, rationalist discourse uh, can shoot itself in the foot. Yeah? Um, it, it is the, the problem that we're dealing with in science as well as in, 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 in conspiracy mythology is that of insecurity, of not knowing. Yeah? And, and also 
uh, of having to speculate or, or, or having to make experimental uh, propositions or even to make fictions. For example, if you create future scenarios, you, know, you, you create fiction, then, then we are in the realm of art. So it is not, I think, that's that would be my personal standpoint, that you can make a kind of clear cut between art and science and say that's the realm of fiction and that's uh, the, uh, the realm of fact, fact. And if you create that, then you create an illusion that easily makes people then also kind of, um, yeah, uh, how do you say, break with the whole system and say, I don't believe anything anymore. And, and I, 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 I <coughs> follow someone on YouTube. Yeah? So I, I think it's 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 a it's also a crisis of this this discourse of of um, yeah uh, of of uh, scientific uh, facticity that, that that we're currently encountering. May I react Which to that? Not because the same. I think mm -hmm. yeah sure. yeah because I think that is partly true. But on the other hand, I'm also now thinking about the climate change uh, denialism and that actually companies like Shell did know that climate change was happening, and yet mm. they actively decided to um to to say that it is that it isn't true that it doesn't exist and to actively spread the idea that it is a nonsense idea and that you know that that was a business model you could say so to that extent that is different than than having the insecurity because the insecurity is actually created so i think there are several different ways yeah in which yeah that can happen you know i think the problem is you can weaponize anything yeah, that's yeah. that's uh, and, and you you that's that's actually I learned that from from Jackie Chan yeah from 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 his martial arts uh, movies you can turn anything into to to, to a weapon and uh, you can turn for example this kind of um, yeah critical rationalism into a weapon but you can also uh, create the acknowledgement of insecurity into a weapon which is what the facile industry is doing. And of course, yeah. I mean, ex exactly in, in, in the case of climate change, because the problem is uh, uh, a climate, the climate is the, the, the perfect example in science for a chaotic system uh, that is really hard to predict, uh, which has so many factors and, and where it's really hard, one of the most difficult things to model and where there's insecurity built into anything that you predict or anything modeling uh, you uh, you make and um of course if you then say you know there is this insecurity and we're dealing with highly sp speculative models etc it's our insecure models with chaotic systems that are hard to predict then people can easily say yeah oh then then then, then this can all be bullshit and we can just keep driving our cars because uh yeah it's it's it's, it's not factual yeah and and mm -hmm. i think this is the kind of discourse that that we need to have in society that uh you know that that the question of of insecurity then yeah, is not being weaponized or not again turned into a kind of binary um, um, uh, proposition. And then it is a, a fact that uh, the, so a lot of things we don't know and are insecure. Mm -hmm. And also this uh, trying to make facts out of it, trying to to maybe what you uh, how you were uh, saying it, Florian, to create this illusion of facts is also a mechanism, a social mechanism to 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 give security to be able to to live <laughs> in this yes, uh, in this course. insecure yeah. reality. So. Uh, this also makes me think about how, uh, in this context, also maybe conspiracy theories can be can be seen, and um, as a way to deal uh, deal yeah. with things. And we also got an interesting question from uh, Eureka Polters um, that asks uh, if you can reflect, both of you actually, um, how we as a society can deal with these conspiracy myths and how to deal with them in uh, productive and uh, mm -hmm. terms. So a good weapon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Laudi, do you want to go first? <laughs> I don't want to speak. So uh, I would like to go first. Um, yeah. It's actually I have quite some discussions about that with people. Like, how do you deal with conspiracy theories? Because usually it's very negative. And also with uh, with Alexander, I have a lot of discussions on how to actually approach people that believe in conspiracy theories. And and we have been discussing that we think that it's actually best to to talk to them like to actually get to understand their world and and what is it they believe in and why 
And to be honest, um, there is one conspiracy person that I once met by accident and very often the thing is that they just want to be heard. At least that's, that's what I've noticed there. And then questioning their ideas can actually help to make them reflect as well. But it also depends on how, how deep someone is in conspiracy thinking. I think... Um, I, I think there is no magical way of dealing with it. Like if you do this, if, if, the, if the newspapers would be like this or if the media would be like that, then conspiracy thinking wouldn't, ha uh, wouldn't happen because it will happen anyway. And it has always happened, basically. <coughs> uh, I think what is problematic is that such a big part of society is believing in conspiracy theories or that at least it gets so much space in... in, in the, the media and in, in people's lives that people don't know what is true anymore. I think a good way of dealing with it is still conversation and um, also, I mean, there are kind of initiatives that try to debunk what is real and what is not. Uh, I think that's important, but still, um, conversation, definitely. Yeah, in my case, yeah, I would come back to, to what I said in my presentation. It's like separate the conspiracy theory from the uh, conspiracy mythology. And first of all, uh, if you get into a kind of binary discourse where you say, you know, any kind of conspiracy narrative is bullshit, then I think you're not doing anything better because there are conspiracies. There are real conspiracies. And I gave some examples, right? Uh, and maybe also an autobiographical note. I, I grew up originally in West Berlin um, in the Cold War. Uh, and you know what we learned after the fall of the war when the Stasi fights were open, you know, that was, <laughs> that, you know, it was wilder than any kind of conspiracy oh, theory. Okay. You couldn't make that up, that shit, you know. But I know you, you, you had um, West Berlin pimp gangs uh, that, that uh, paid um, uh, uh, um, uh, corruption money to, to conservative politicians for... Um, uh, uh, for real estate projects, but were actually on the payroll of the Stasi and this kind of thing. I mean, if you made this up, if you would have made a film or a novel back in the time, people would have declared you're completely crazy. So, so first of all, I think it's to acknowledge, yes, there are conspiracies and let's look at, at, at real conspiracies that exist, yeah? such as uh, internet surveillance, for example. Yeah? Um, um, and, and that's number one. And then even if you're dealing, let's say with someone who's deeply into a mythology, so let's take QAnon. Uh, the the elites are um, sucking the blood in in satanic rites of our children, right? Uh, uh, in in underground uh, uh, basements, under pizza, pizza parlors, and stuff like that. Um, then this is actually a proposal that doesn't come from me, but from my uh, colleague and friend, uh, Felix Stoller. He said, yeah, but still there, there's a kernel of truth. What is the kernel of truth here? Of course, not that the elites are in satanic rites uh, slaughtering children, but if you live in the USA uh, in, in the past 10 years after the economic crisis, and for example, you want to have a college education for your children and you can no longer afford it, or you can, cannot afford it without going into ruinous debt, um, then you can indeed say, you know, on a figurative level, on a metaphorical level, yes, the elites, um, the, the, the rich people of this country have been drinking the, the blood of our children. Yeah? Uh, there, there is actually, this is the kernel of truth. Uh, and, 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 and if you disacknowledge that, if you say, no, the elites are not drinking the blood, blood of our children, then, then you also disacknowledge that, that kind of um, very valid critique. Exactly. Which it's brings like me, if why. I may, to... Hmm. Perhaps a last question. I'm looking at the clock and we have very little time left. I'm very sorry. That went very quick. We already said while meeting just before this uh, live programming started, we could talk till three o'clock in the morning, um, which we shall not do oh, here, yeah. but there is going to be in, a, the, in the Zoom bar after. <laughs> an after talk in the Zoom bar. If so, everybody on Planet Impact, if you move to the second floor, there is a so-called rooftop bar where you can just continue conversations among yourselves. And we learned that Florian and Laudi might be joining you. Um, a last question here in the plenary. Um, your metaphorical stance on this, uh, this blood drinking, it is almost a, a religious metaphor, no? And many of the examples that mm -hmm. you have been using are examples from, let's say, our Western philosophical political traditions. Would any of you dare to say 
something about conspiracy theories or conspiracy mythologies in other philosophical traditions? Do they exist? Do they play the same role? Have they been playing a stronger role over the last 10 years with the arrival of internet? Or is that maybe a subject for our next Impact TV? <laughs> I think it, it would be a subject for, for another Impact TV with someone who's really knowledgeable about that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you could also say, it, yes, it has to do with Western uh, um, religion and, and Western metaphysics, which makes this kind of um, strict divide between, um, you know, if you are religious, between a spiritual world um, and, 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 and a material world. This, this is what we have in Platonism. This is what we have in Christianity, etc. And for example, if you would go let's say, into Shintoism or uh, Taoism in East Asia, or if you would go into African religions, then it's actually a cohabitation um, of, of uh, mm -hmm. a spiritual world and a material world that might be actually a good way of, of, of forecoming kind of conspiracy uh, uh, theories because um, the, the spirits are not detached from your life. There is not this alienation. But I'm really not an expert to talk on this. I mean, somebody who is no more knowledgeable should do that. So we put that one on the list for a future. Mm. Um, then maybe we're going to have one last question from the audience. Shall we, Michelle? Yes. And actually, it might be... Go ahead. Actually... Excuse me? Oh, yeah. Actually, maybe a nice question also as a... Um, um, yeah, as a last one before going also to the to the Zoom bar, uh, Florian, in uh, in your presentation, you were also sharing some memes, and uh, mm -hmm. so maybe the question might be as a as a nice lighter question to close off. What is your? Can you tell us about a nice meme, or do you have a nice uh, both of you a nice conspiracy theories meme? And also uh, all the people at home, if you have a favorite one, share it with us afterwards in the Zoom bar. For now, let's hear if you have a. A nice one. Laudi, do you have a good conspiracy meme? Mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> I think we have to do it in the Zoom bar. We give us some time to, yeah. to, to, to search up a good uh, meme and we'll share it with you in the Zoom bar. Yeah, you had already a couple in your, uh, in your presentation, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love memes. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. Yeah. <laughs> So then, if that is a promise that you'll be sharing your memes in the rooftop bar, mm -hmm. I think we've come to a conclusion <laughs> of this uh, yes. second Impact TV program uh, and the first one here in planetimpact.nl. Uh, thank you very much, Laudi. Thank you very much, Florian. I think we are getting to this part where we're also going to announce that there's a new episode coming up on the 3rd of June. And yes. on 3rd of June, we'll be discussing the new book, Hysteria written by Mark Schadenburg, and Mark Schadenburg himself will be joining us. We hope you'll be joining us too. And on the behalf of Michelle and myself, thank you very much for joining us and hope to see many of you in the rooftop bar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>